Is it possible that we have the ruins of a relatively developed ancient civilization stretching over a couple of continents right in front of our eyes and we don't notice it? Even to the point that we don't even have a name for it? This is not a joke or an exaggeration. In this documentary I'll show you that this is exactly the case and I will let the images of the ruins speak for themselves. These rooms were part of an elegant dwelling not so long ago, but as all devouring time stripped their walls of the decoration, they no longer feel attractive to the eye. And in the same manner as time strips the stylish elements from the rock-cut ruins, they become less and less interesting to the common man. A magnificent, richly decorated castle, when defeated by time, turns into this. Probably you are already thinking, forget about common man, this is work for historians, what do they say about these ruins? Actually, a very small portion of these uh, ruins is given the respect the historic site deserves, and I will start my narration with uh, selected jokes from the results of the so-called research that the official academia has conducted on such sites. Via Amerina, north of Rome. If you look for an official information about it, you will find something of this sort. They will tell you it's a Roman road. Then they will continue with stories about a certain Roman guy who made it in two years. And then they will kindly provide educational sketches for you, something of this sort. But if you actually go to the place, you will find out that it is interesting because of the impressive rock-cut ruins on the side, and it is only a small, very small portion of it that has some Roman paving in the middle. So, in other words, because of a short, unimpressive segment of pavement, they are misleadingly crediting the Romans with the rock-cut ruins. And it is only in specialized literature where one will find the notes like and this Roman site was built on the ruins of an older track. Track? This is track. And this is track. This is not a track. This is uh, probably something like a marketplace. And only the tip of it is sticking from the ground. The lower levels are not even excavated. Of course, such an excavation will be extremely dangerous because it may damage or move few pebbles of the precious Roman pavement. And by the way, the dwellings or the shops on both sides of the road must have been very beautiful while still in use because uh, they had uh, remains of uh, plastering and uh, various... Um, borders and also the beautiful co uh, cornices mm -hmm. cornice like work around here also now let's go to the impressive rock cut amphitheater at sutri it is rather huge as you can see its style is uh, clearly that of the rock cut ruins i've been showing you so far now what to do? It's a problem. There is no Roman pavement to declare the amphitheater Roman. Not a big problem. Quackademics are skilled in a forgery. That's why they made this Roman-looking gate. Yes, I'm not joking. This patch that uh, clearly belongs to another style is 100% modern addition. And the excuse for adding a patch that visibly belongs to another style is as follows. Well, although the local people somehow made it in a different style, the full amphitheater must have been Roman, and that's why we can put a Roman-looking gate. Must have been! Excellent! Exactly like this, one small lie at a time, our history is stolen and distorted beyond recognition.
But Italy is neither the only place where such rock cut ruins are found, nor the main one. For example, in terms of amphitheaters, we have very similar ones in Petro Jordan and in Tiermes, Spain. The style is not just very close, it is absolutely identical. Again, we are told that the Romans built it, and of course there is a slight problem, there shouldn't have been really that many Romans in uh, Petra, but that is easily solved. They came there and built it. And the only proof, of course, is that it perfectly matches the rest of the stories that they are telling. No, there were no Romans taking short trips to exotic locations, nor any other foreigners built it as usual the people who lived in the rock cut ruins next to it. And as far as the dwellings, people are told that these are actually tombs, burial chambers, although there is no proof of it whatsoever, and although they look like residences with a water supply and everything else, reaching in some cases 10 floors deep, below ground level, but to avoid uh, unnecessary curiosity, everything is easily solved, because simply they are not being excavated. But the sites of this civilization, without a name, the civilization of the rock cutters, were not mistakenly attributed only to the Romans. No, basically to any culture that could be handy taken from the original history where such ruins would be found. For example, if you browse popular sources of so-called uh, history for the keyword Domus de Janus, these are the type of rocket ruins, that's how they are called in Sardinia at least, uh, with great authority they will assure you that these are rocket tombs, without a doubt. On the other hand, if you read specialized literature of those who have been actually studying them out there in the fields, you will read that they were reused as burials by simple people who were putting the dead members of their tribe in Domus Diana or any other ruin or even natural cavity that they could find handy. Basically, they were reusing them, but who would read specialized literature for every single thing? This is impossible. People just take for granted what's there in the popular literature and the history textbooks and assume that it must be a summary of the actual scientific finds, which, uh, unfortunately, way too often is not at all the case. The Corinth Canal could possibly be yet another example how the credit of uh, constructing the marvelous engineering achievements by the old civilization is given to somebody else that it doesn't belong to. In the official history of the canal, they will give you all kinds of details, how engineers were thinking about it, building it for many years and so on and so forth. But just look at what we see on its wall. Most likely, at the time of its official construction, they only cleaned it up and possibly remodeled it. And as far as the official explanation of the old ruins, that's... Uh, well, people in the past were attempting to make such a canal, but they were unsuccessful. And this is an old photo from the times of the so-called construction of the canal. This stone work could possibly be predating the canal's so-called construction and it could be even polygonal. The big stone blocks seem a bit out of uh, proportion compared to the usual size of stone used during a typical construction some hundred years ago or so. Now, many of you are probably wondering, how is it possible that, that all these rock-cut ruins belong to unknown civilization if some of them bear inscriptions belonging to well-known and well-studied cultures and civilizations? Like, for example, this is probably a legitimate 
inscription on a officially so-called Etruscan necropolis. And all the other Oroccat ruins would belong to their respective local cultures, as the Quacademia is assuring us. What's the problem with this? Here are the problems with this simple solution. This is your Etruscan necropolis in Turkey. It even has the typical design of the two lions facing each other, which is so common for many Etruscan necropolises. And here are your Etruscan necropolises in Greece. Even the inscriptions of them look so similar. And here are your perfectly Etruscan looking tombs in Jordan. Somewhat far away from Etruria, isn't it? And here are your Etruscan ruins in Sicily, again, hundreds of kilometers away from their homeland, the so called Etruria in central Italy. And these are just a few out of the many parallels in architecture. In the next episodes, we'll see the parallels in their rock cut roads. Decide for yourself what are the odds that in various locations, in some cases separated from each other by thousands of kilometers, the simple folks will decide one day, hmm, I'm too bored today. Maybe I should start digging into the solid hard bedrock a road, even though I can drive my donkey cart on the ground, I no longer wish to do so, instead I will dig meters deep, road kilometers long in the solid bedrock. Yes, uh, very strange, uh, at least for us. Rock cut roads are there all the way from Israel to Spain and Portugal and uh, possibly even North America. And all these uh, roads have uh, some sort of uh, curious marks that I find no way to associate with any model of cards. Some of them are quadratic, while others leave the impression as if uh, some sort of a tank or a bagger drove on it. And they are all the same, from China to maybe North America. In addition to that, we have single tracks, which I also find very difficult to associate with any possible model of cart. And again, all these are found again and again in various far away from each other regions. And on the top of all this, these rocket ruins of the unknown civilization that from now on I will call the civilization of Egil for short. They were not built all at once, but uh, several distinct layers can be seen made probably over a very extended period of time. And in addition to everything said so far, I will be showing you lots of parallels, which not only connect faraway locations, but they connect them with multiple threads, so to say. Meaning, the same distinct layers are visible at the different places, and on the top of that, each individual layer has similarities in architecture. On one side, there is no doubt that the people who cut all this in the rock were closely connected with each other, although they lived in separate continents. 
and yet on the other hand, these sites, some of them bear undeniable connection to very simple local cultures. This seems like some sort of a predicament, but it will seem like this only until we believe the descriptions of these local cultures given by the mainstream quackademia. Usually what they do is they show you an image of a broken piece of uh, ceramics and basically that's all the proof in terms of facts that they can provide for all the stories that they will be telling you about the particular culture. The broken piece of uh, ceramics is to create the psychological impression that some field work has been going on. And so they will assure you that uh, the people led uh, very basic lives of agricultural pursuits and yes, some special ones could do trade, international travel would be an exception, things like that. But if you read an original old text and see what the people of those times would say with their own words, the picture is radically different. The people had a radiant, exciting lives connecting with nature spirits, they appointed us their leaders, not thieves and liars like us, but really brave men or magicians who were connecting to higher beings. Those beings, you can call them gods or guardian spirits, whatever. They were interacting with men, teaching them, Maybe travel was not uh, carried out only with physical means as we do nowadays, but possibly also through magical doorways, like doors cut in the stone that don't open, at least for our standards. When visiting these places, I, I sometimes like to imagine the possibilities of what they may have been like when new. There were little hints here and there of the more sophisticated architecture that these sites may have once had. It was evident that these structures were not crudely carved stone caves, but once had things like smooth plaster, Romanesque columns, elegant carvings and statues, and even some tiled walls remained. You see these things, and piece by piece it begins to paint uh, a more vivid picture. And after days of walking among these sites, we visited a more modern, more recent historic site known as the Cathedral of Orvieto, dated from the 14th century. When you go inside, it is very heavily decorated, very ornate, and very colorful. It was different from the old ruins, uh, for sure, but it also felt in some ways familiar somehow. And while walking through this place, I spotted a column inside that was heavily worn and had lost its layer of paint. And it looked just like plain old stone. Uh, something that would have fit right in at the older ruins. So now when I look at these more ancient sites, I can't help but wonder if they could have been just as colorful and intricately detailed when they were fresh, and that those frail details were just lost to the passage of time. The details are lost, and all that remains is the most basic understructure of what once was there. And because the fine details are lost, mainstream history looks to them as primitive in design. Perhaps the 
older the site, the more details are lost, and so the more primitive it is labeled by the Quacademia, creating a false sense of progress in our minds. In just a few thousand years, in most cases, materials we associate with civilization, like uh, metal, wood, glass, or even plastics and uh, rubbers, could all be turned to dust without a trace. All that would be left is the stone. And maybe that's why the further you go back in the mainstream history, the more it paints a picture of this kind of stone age, where humans were just too dumb, too unevolved to have technology. Really, I think we have no idea what the past was truly like. And it will remain that way for as long as we limit ourselves to only material-based thinking.